This week on Wealth Track, the case for European stocks. Do the well publicized negatives outweigh the little known positives? Value oriented contrarian money manager Philippe Prager Trelat presents the evidence and explains why his mutual series funds are saying may we to Europe. Next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. The Wintergreen Fund, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Dreamin Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Whenever we hear about European investments these days, it is frequently bad news and often in a derogatory fashion. The acronym PIGS, for instance, for the foreign debt problems of Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, is now being replaced by gypsies reordering the countries in order of the severity of their problems, starting with Greece and ending with Italy. Threats to the survival of the euro as a common European currency have been a major headline generator, and just recently the UK reported a surprise contraction in its economy. Now, these are not events that necessarily build confidence in investors. But this week's guest says that these troubling headlines actually make some European shares very attractive. Philippe Roger Trelat is a contrarian investor who has over 25 years of experience in the European equity markets, training under legendary mutual series value investors Max Heine and Michael Price. He is portfolio manager of the Four Star Mutual European Fund, a Morningstar analyst pick, and he's co-portfolio manager of the Mutual Global Discovery Fund and several others. Roger Trelat has been finding bargains in Europe during its financial and economic difficulties by focusing on large multinational corporations that are headquartered in Europe, but do a huge amount of their business in the flourishing emerging economies of Asia and Latin America. His largest holdings, such as British American Tobacco and Nestle, have sales and profits that heavily depend on fast-growing emerging markets. British American Tobacco, for example, does business in 180 countries and has leadership positions in 50 of those markets. Only a small percentage of its earnings come from the UK. In my recent interview, I asked Roger Trelat why, with all of the negative European news, investors should be interested in European equities. Because people focus overlay on, on the problems and, and, and leave aside tremendous opportunities. Uh, you know, uh, Europe is much more than you know, a number of countries which are indeed experiencing uh, credit issues. They are real, they are big headwinds. But it's, let me give you a simple example. Uh, Greece, the GDP of Greece, is half the GDP of Bavaria. So That's it's shocking. Not, it's, it's not a big issue. I think the, the, there, there are no economic problems in, 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 in Europe. Because if you look at uh, the northern part of Europe, which is basically Germany, France, and the hinterland, and even the UK, they are doing very well. They are competitive. They are not credit constrained. They are, they are, their GDP are, are, are growing uh, uh, very, very fast. And they are actually enjoying the whole thing uh, upwards. And the reason why we had good uh, uh, data points from uh, an economic standpoint recently is precisely because of that. So, so when people talk about per the European peripherals, which is uh, the also the gypsies and the pigs, Correct. whatever it is, Correct. I mean, they truly are, and forgive me anyone from any of those countries who's listening to this, but, but the, the, they are not dragging down Northern Europe then, in other words. So, so you're saying that, that Germany and France and the UK, for instance, are, are actually bringing up, that they can support the oh, Eurozone. Absolutely. If you look at the history of the European uh, Union, it has always proceeded by leaps and bounds, and crisis always uh, uh, was a catalyst for further progress. And I think we are right in the middle of that. There is little leadership being, being shown right now. But talk to uh, any businessman in Europe is convinced that uh, 
uh, the euro and the, the, the European Union has brought in a period of stability and prosperity which hadn't been seen in centuries. And I think it's only a matter of time before the politicians uh, do the same. And we already have signs that they are starting to get their act together. And what are the signs that you're most optimistic about or the most heartened by? The signs are, I think those who uh, predict or, or, or talk about the demise of the euro are, are, are totally underestimating the strengths of the idea of the European U Union, unity among not only business people, but also politicians of every color. You know, l let me ask you one more question on that. And, you know, there's, a, there's a, a perception in this country that the Germans, for instance, that the German populace especially, is just saying we are not going to be the, the pocketbook, the wallet for peripheral Europe, for instance, and that in fact that Germany is the one that could make or break the Euro, the Eurozone and the Euro. What's, what's your assessment of the, of the German attitude towards, towards Europe? Well, there's a lot of, of uh, you know, at the, at the street level, at the populist level, yes, there's a lot of uh, ambiguity about uh, the European uh, uh, ID. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you very, very straightforwardly that Germany has been the biggest beneficiary of the European Union. Germany has been the biggest beneficiary of the, of the Euro. Why? Because, number one, trade with, between Germany and the rest of Europe has grown exponentially since the introduction of the Euro. Germany's uh, uh, GDP is very, very export-oriented. Over 35% of German GDP is exports. That is huge. And where do these, these exports go? But they go not only to Asia and China, but they also go to the other uh, countries in Europe. And there's absolutely no doubt that if Germany went back uh, to uh, Deutsche Mark, let's call it a Uber Euro, uh, that would kill the German economy because immediately it would be seen as one of the most solid currencies in the world, would jump against the dollar, and all the competitiveness of the German economy would disappear, and jobs would be lost by the thousands, the tens of thousands. So the Euro stands, you think, the Eurozone stands? Absolutely. That's going to be great. I don't, you know, I'm not saying it's going to be resolved overnight, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, there's going to be periods of stress, there's going to be period of uh, uncertainties and, and concern, but at the end of the day, I have absolutely no, uh, no doubt whatsoever that the uh, politicians and the ECB will set something permanent and uh, significant. So how are you taking advantage of, of the unrest that we're seeing and, and the, really the questions that are being raised about the viability of, of the euro yeah. in, in, the, European, uh, in sure. the mutual European fund? Sure, it's a good question. You know, everybody is setting down the, 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 the euro. Nobody, everybody, particularly here, thinks it's, uh, it's doomed. At the same time, there's been a, 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 an indiscriminate devaluation of European equities, particularly since uh, spring of 2010. And uh, what people seem to forget is that there are a number of companies which are listed in Europe. They, uh, they are domiciled in Europe. But at the end of the day, they are not very European in their activities or their footprint. And I'm talking uh, about the big uh, exporters. Of course, there are a number of them in Germany. I mentioned the importance of exports for, for Germany, but you find them every, everywhere in the UK, in Scandinavia, Such in, uh, as in France. Well, Vodafone, for instance, is a very global company. Mm -hmm. uh, Schneider in France is a very global company. Uh, it's not only the Siemens and the Daimler or Volkswagen, but there are a great number of. Uh, of, uh, of uh, c companies, and in Scandinavia you could certainly use uh, uh, SKF, which is a very large uh, ball bearings manufacturers, mm -hmm. which has a, a, a very, very wide global footprint. So is, is this a, a theme of, of investing yeah. by you, is, yeah. is they can be domiciled in Europe, for instance, and yeah. because of that actually mm -hmm. undervalued? But but they they're doing a lot of business overseas. Sure. you know uh, in the rest of the world. Absolutely, I mean they derive you know between twenty five and seventy five percent of their revenues and earnings from uh, other areas of the world, which are experiencing uh, higher growth. It's the U.S. and it's Asia and obviously it's China. So my understanding, I, I know when I talked to you earlier, you mentioned that 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 has had been a, a focus of yeah. yours as well. The, the European companies that were exporting to yeah. the rest of the world, especially Asia. Um, but you're also starting to focus on European companies for your for domestic consumption, right? That's correct. So why are you making that well, transition? Well, because the, the, the exporter theme was very much a, a, a theme of last year. You know, it started in, in last spring. Uh, we found 
extremely attractive opportunities during the summer. Uh, there's no doubt that since then, particularly with the market we had, the a number of these stories have, have developed and are, uh, are a bit long in the tooth now. And looking forward, yes, there's still an, you know, uh, 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 some argument to be said about those exporters, but I think if you really want to make money in 2011, it's time to look at those uh, which uh, uh, are more domestic in their nature. And why? Because I think that the uh, GDP growth in Europe is going to surprise on the upside. It is not going to be as anemic as people expect. How is it going to compare to the U.S.? It's going to be lower, obviously. Mm -hmm. but Except not in Germany, it's not, right? Uh, ge not only Germany, right. but Scandinavia, right. the Benelux, and, and even France. Mm -hmm. But as, as a whole, it will be lower. It will be lower, right. dragged down by these countries at the right. So, the so, so, for instance, w I mean, can you give me a, an example or two of, of companies that, that specifically have business that is that thrives on domestic consumption? Well, you have a number of sectors which mm -hmm. you can look at. You have the, 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 the telephone, the telecom sector, uh, which is particularly attractive considering the, uh, the valuations there. You have uh, something very unpopular, but which could become less unpopular, the utilities, and not only in Germany, which are very unpopular, but there are other utilities. Why are they so unpopular? They're so unpopular because, um, first of all, uh, power prices have come down tremendously because of the crisis, and uh, they are um, uh, being squeezed uh, in their earnings by a discrepancy between the cost th they incur buying gas and the price at which they sell it. Uh, that has uh, squeezed the earnings and that is, uh, is not good. And last but not least, if we're suddenly and very unexpectedly slapped with a, a, a 4 billion euro uh, tax on their nuclear uh, assets. Why? Because the German government needed to balance its budget. The utilities are usually big and full of cash and there you go, let's, let's tax them. The same happened, in, by the way, in Belgium as well. So utilities could utilities, be utilities, right, telecoms, uh, and retail. I mean, you could have uh, you know the, the, there is a very healthy segment of consumers in in Europe, particularly again in the northern half of Europe, which are not credit constrained, which uh, there hasn't been a housing bubble. There's no um, uh, real estate issues, and if you look at the statistic, the um, share of salaries in the national income is actually growing in countries like Sweden. Uh, and but also in Germany. So therefore, looking at you know, some German uh, retailers could be a good idea. Now, another uh, strategy that you're employing now is that yeah. you, s you said you're developing an appetite for risk. Yeah, yeah. You know, we're always contrarian at Mutual Series. We like to <laughs> go where it's complicated, unpopular, and uh, we, we, we have the patience, we have value investors. Value investors are patient by definition. And we, 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 uh, we like to pick stocks where uh, uh, everything seems to be going against them. And I will venture a, 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 a pronostic that um, this year, if you really want to make money in Europe and have a nice better, uh, perhaps the time is to invest in some European financials. Now, this is a shocking, shocking <laughs> statement. I'll probably be left out to drive, but I think that at some point this year, uh, banks will be really money, big money makers for investors. Now, you have to be very selective. There are a lot of banks which may not make it. Uh, there are a lot really? of banks which may restructure or uh, heavily recapitalize and therefore diluting their shareholders to death, but there will be definitely some winners uh, which will come out of this crisis stronger, better capitalized, and still you can buy them at multiples of book value or of earnings which haven't been seen in decades. When you're looking at the financial sector uh, in, in Europe, as, yeah. as far as the opportunities are yeah. concerned, are, are there, there different tiers? Oh, yes. Of an, and, and I mean, and how risky oh are you yes. willing to go? Or? Well, we are very risk averse, so we, right. we, we go for safety. If you really want to make money, perhaps, perhaps, you go and buy uh, Portuguese banks or, or, or Spanish banks. But that is not what I would not call... Not your style? It's not our style. It's not, you know, you, don't, you, you wouldn't be sleeping very well at right. night because the risks are simply too high. 
And by the way, the valuations are not that attractive anyway, relative to other less risky uh, uh, banks, like uh, you know, there are a number of banks like uh, BNP uh, in France, mm -hmm. like UBS in Switzerland, and and one I like particularly, I think, is very attractive now is is Barclays mm -hmm. in the in the UK. UK. Yeah. You just said it that at, at Mutual Series, you're, you are value investors. Yeah. Value means a lot of things to a lot of different people. So, what does it mean to you? I, I can give you a very qu mm -hmm. you know, quick answer: is that we like stocks which are undervalued for the wrong reasons. Those which are undervalued for the right reasons, we try to avoid them because they are called value traps. But when we look at a stock, we like stocks which are selling either at low multiples, mm -hmm. and we are not so much focused on earnings, but very much on cash flow how cash flow is generated by a company, and most importantly, how it's utilized by a company. Do you consider yourself to be a deep value investor? I mean, are, are, you, are you looking at <laughs> you know, distressed values, for instance? I don't or? like the word deep when you talk about value, because <laughs> I, you know, when I started in, in the business 25 years ago, you could buy a UK investment trust, which was a, a, a mutual fund listed, uh, to except it was a closed-end investment company, listed on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, selling at 50% discount to its asset value. Uh, these, these have disappeared. I remember one very well, which we invested in called the Winter Bottom Energy Trust, which had nothing in its uh, uh, assets but cash and mm. stocks in the US majors. So you could buy Exxon and Mobile and, 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 and Texaco at 50% mm. discount. That to me is deep value. Mm -hmm. Markets have become efficient, at least a lot more efficient than then, and, and that, that doesn't exist anymore. How important are dividends? It seems to be a theme of, of yeah. a lot of wealth we like yes, dividends. these days. We like dividends, but we're not an income fund. We like dividends. The reason I like dividends is uh, I like to be paid while waiting for a catalyst to unlock itself. Mm -hmm. You know, when we buy, when we look at a stock, uh, yes, it's cheap, but that's only one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is what's going to make that undervaluation disappear. Uh, and if you have no idea how it's going to happen, you could be stuck for years and years and years. And therefore, you have to have an idea of what's going to make that uh, undervaluation disappear. And meanwhile, it could take, you know, a while, it could take months, it could take a couple of years, that happens. And I like to be paid while waiting. One of the other things that, that you and I were talking about earlier is that you know, whereas Europe is considered to be you know cold for as far as it, it's a cold topic as far as investors sure, are concerned, sure. but the emerging markets are a very hot topic. Yeah, and that worries you. The emerging markets yeah. worry you for a lot of reasons. But but w what's your take on on emerging market? You know, I try to shy away from what's popular because usually the the, the money has been made, and I don't want to be le the guy left handing the hat. Uh, I think uh, emerging market bonds are very toppy. I would certainly not put any money there. It, it was last year and the year before story. Uh, even emerging equities, although I'm not a great specialist, look to me uh, fairly, fairly valued to fully valued. And, and you're concerned about, uh, especially about the, the, the predictions about China, that uh. China is this economy that's just going to keep on warring ahead. And it was interesting uh, that, that you, you sent me a, a part of a report about that there's been an important milestone passed sure, sure. It's, that, that it could mean that, in fact, China's going to slow. It was very interesting. Yeah, it will slow, but it will slow still to very, you know, High to, levels, to, to levels which everybody would envy in, uh, in the developed world. Right. But what's interesting, as you mentioned, is that uh, uh, China now has reached uh, 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 an income per capita of $7,000. Which sounds very low to it us. It sounds but very low. But historically, if you look at emerging markets, that has proved to be a turning point for the nature of the of the, of, the, of the development of the economic growth of the country, uh, where suddenly investment spending slows down. But that slack is t more than taken up by consumer spending. And something tells me that if you look ahead uh, over the next 12 months, uh, the, 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 the big industrial importers, you know, those, that investment demand which has been fueling all these uh, earnings growth and s revenue growth from European companies is probably going to slow down. But what is probably going to pick up as well, and much more than people expect, is consumer spending, internal demand from China, Chinese people, you know, the emerging middle class. And if you look at companies in sectors like insurance broking, um, car dealership, um, 
gaming or um, uh, advertising, there are, there are a number of companies which look extremely attractive. There. So is, is that's a theme of yours as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's, so and again, looking yeah. at the European companies, yeah. that that is still even though that's an area that, that you said a little bit earlier yeah. has been pretty well, well picked over, yeah. right? Correct. Um, but there are you think that there are great opportunities ahead longer term that the the Chinese consumer in fact is yeah. going to be a, a, a spending more and more, right? Mind. Right, and and some themes which were connected to exports, particularly uh, to China, for instance, in the automotive sector in in uh, in Europe, you know, the Daimler and the Volkswagen of the world, um, are still, I think, uh, interesting stories. But not so much because of the Chinese angle, but because of sales in Europe, in Germany, or in the U.S where they are very active, are probably going to surprise on the upside. Oh. So it's not so much a China story, which everybody's heard about, but it's going to be more like a developed market story. Oh, that's interesting. So, so looking at your portfolios that, mm -hmm. you, that you manage, and you manage several, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's, the, what's the most interesting stock story in your portfolios? Right now, mm -hmm. you know, I hate to give one stock because I it's, uh, it's uh, you hang your neck on on one on one thing. Uh, as I said, I think uh, the the one with the most potential, you know, on a risk reward basis, the most attractive one could be Barclays. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it's a big it's a big uh, cap. It's about sixty billion dollars. Uh, uh, it's cheap. It's very cheap. Does it uh, have a fair amount of cash? It's, uh, it's very strong. It's one mm -hmm. of the rare banks which, uh, in Europe which didn't have to avail itself of government emergency funding. Um, they were somehow helped by some Middle Eastern sovereign funds, but the British government never uh, 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 invested in the equity of that bank. They never needed a rights issue. They have a good, comfortable capital position. They generate sufficient equity for their retained earnings every year uh, to be more than above the, the minimum imposed by Basel III or even a stricter version imposed by the UK government. You have a decent dividend. And what I like too is that you have two listed assets in Barclays, which is uh, BlackRock, where they have about 20%, and uh, a bank in South Africa, which is called APSA, ABSA, Associated Bank of South Africa, where they have 55%. And the market value of those two assets is about 30% of the value of Barclays. So this is the kind of angle we like to, uh, to take. And, and, and the new CEO, uh, Bob Diamond, is a, is a very well-regarded uh, banking executive. Uh, and uh, Barclays, will definitely benefit from a pickup in um, consumer and commercial lending in the UK, and I see that coming. Is there another company that you think that we should know about that you've invested in in the, in the mutual? Yeah, it's a UK telecom company. It's called Vodafone. Interestingly, it's, uh, it's got an, uh, an interesting US angle. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a global telecom company, very active in Europe, but also with a significant uh, presence in, in India, for instance, which is growing very fast. Uh, it's, got a good it's got a good CEO, uh, which suddenly uh, uh, changed the focus from size to profitability, so that's something very good. Uh, it's a company which uh, is reorganizing its portfolio of assets. Before, their assets looked like a, a stamp collection, where they had little of everything everywhere. Uh, now they seem to uh, be more keen on getting control of their uh, uh, operating subsidiary. But the interesting angle on, uh, on, uh, on Vodafone is it's 45% in Verizon Wireless. And 45% of Verizon Wireless, that is an investment which has not produced a, a dividend for Vodafone in a, in, in a long time. Why? Because uh, Verizon Wireless was heavily indebted and the parent, the US parent Verizon Inc., uh, had decided, who controlled with 55%, had decided that the priority at wireless would be to uh, uh, deleverage, which has been done. While Verizon Wireless is a gigantic cash flow machine, and uh, by the end of this year they should be debt free, at which time uh, the issue of resuming a dividend payment 
uh, uh, will, will arise. It has a reason already. I know there are talks uh, between Verizon Inc. and Vodafone. And should that happen uh, on, on very conservative payout ratio, you could see a significant addition to the cash flow of Vodafone to the tune of 25 to 30%. That's very powerful. Very powerful indeed. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, Philippe Bruger Toulat. Thanks so much for being with us on Wealth Track. Thank you for having me. A true contrarian value investor. And on that note, we will conclude this edition of Wealth Track. Next week, we'll be focusing on a hot area that has recently cooled off. We'll discuss the outlook for, and strategy for Asia and China specifically with great investor Mark Headley of the pioneering Matthews Asia Funds. Until then, to watch this program again, please go to our website, wealthtrack.com, to see it as a podcast or streaming video. And while you are there, check out our new WealthTrack app so you can tune in on your smartphone or tablet wherever and whenever you choose. Thank you for watching and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Luma Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Research Affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market. The Wintergreen Fund, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Dreamin Foundation. Thank you.